Welcome to Let's Play Rule the Waves 3 as Germany starting in 1935. It's 1947, we've had our first major fleet battle, and as a consequence of that, I asked the important question, should you sack me? I've personally felt my performance wasn't as good as it could be, and so I wanted to get some feedback from my peer admirals, and feedback I got. So here we have your judgment and a little bit of amusing about what is it to be a great or a good or a bad admiral? Uh, how does that all work? However, first of all, I've asked Admiral Brygon to uh, deliver a formal judgment. So let me just go through this carefully because he's put a lot of thought into it, as indeed so many of you have. I speak now as the spokesperson for the Board of Inquiry, presenting the conclusion with the summaries of the collective. The conclusion of the board was reached by a slim majority of 57% for exoneration. This view was expressed well by Admiral Grace Good by quoting Tsar Nicholas' parting words to Marshal de Tolly, I commend to you my army, take care of it, as it's the only one I have. Technical note, I struggled to find this quote. Some suggested it was Napoleon, but let's, uh, let's not avoid the overall sentiment here. The officer under review did complete his mission objectives as given whilst avoiding major loss. There were frequently within the exoneration decisions comments of the possibilities balanced against the risk and the difficulties in intelligence reports such as the state of HMS Centurion. The board also wishes it observed that 38% voted for private censure with only 5% for relief relieving. That is, for every three exoneration, there were two for censure. As a significant view, the board shall elaborate on the censure, though not sinking the centurion when it was there uh, for sinking, not sinking the remaining transports, only eight out of some twenty, failure to close for a night surface action by the cruisers and destroyers, Failure to mount nighttime air attacks, uh, although that is at the risk of greater air crew losses, but that had been a subject of discussion uh, offline with Admiral Brygon himself, actually. Of the available possibilities, the officer under review chose a full disengagement. There's also notes on less than best practice in the use of aircraft, such as not setting target priority, again, then complaining on the air crew's selection of targets. Therefore, the board further recommends that the scenario be considered for officer training for these factors. One, tactical risk assessment. How much balance of risk and gain can you do? Number two, assessing the uncertainty of information, more of which a little bit later. Number three, the assigning of aircraft roles and targets. Number four, methods for night surface action. And number five, methods for night air action, including the recovery of aircraft. And that concludes the board's presentation. Thanks to Brangon for that. Uh, here's the results. So 5% uh, for relieving, 38% for censure, nearly 20% more saying exonerate. So, you know, I wonder whether there's any kind of opportunities for a nice medal. I mean, certainly if I was a North Korean admiral, it would be uh, festooned with the whole thing. Here's a word cloud of, uh, there were nearly 100 comments on both the survey and on the video, so I, I, I can't really do full justice, um, but here are many of the uh, comments that were used. And of course, the ever important inspiration from Darth Vader to not fail you again. And then Admiral uh, Testenhauer came up with the obvious um, observation, Haben Sie Tomaten auf den Organ, which for non-German speakers obviously means, do you have tomatoes on your eyes? Meaning, not able or even uh, unwilling to see or recognize the obvious. 
and we can all smile at other languages, um, idioms, because they're not straightforward, such as straightforward, because if you're learning English, you know what the word straight means, and you know what the word forward means, and if you combine them together, it doesn't mean either of the two those things. So, how to get the tomatoes off your eyes? Well, um, know that you are going to get misidentification in the ship type. This varies by the ship identification level, more of which in a moment, and is degraded by weather and is degraded by the lighting condition. You must realize that the ship damage level reported is prone to misidentification and is more indicative of what can be seen from afar rather than an actual report. The ship speed, which is given in, given in increments of five knots, is also subject to misreporting, the exception being when it's stationary. And air reports are particularly prone to misreporting both of the composition and the course, and of course the truth of any air report, even if it's accurate, degrades over time. To help you, I say you, to help me with this, what can you trust? So you can trust the course of a ship other than on air reports. You can trust if a ship is stationary. If you triangulate three or more reports and they cluster around the same place and they show the same sort of force, then you can have greater confidence that it's really there. If perchance they even show the same course or similar course, then you know likewise that's helpful too. And then know that your ship identification level goes from it's a ship to it's a possible ship type, like a transport or a carrier, to finally a ship class. Uh, when it reports a ship class, you can have pretty high confidence that actually that is what it is. But And when it reports that it's a ship, actually you can be pretty confident that there is a ship there. It's this middle, the ship type, that is very vulnerable. Depending on the range of the sighting, depending on the weather and lighting conditions, and depending on the level of technology of your radar as well. So, yeah, focusing on this should remove all tomatoes that have been sitting on anyone's eyes. And then another great, great observation from Admiral Saw Spitfire was the similarity with the Battle of Samar, part of Leyte Gulf, which, if nothing else, is a brilliant study in a confused battle. So Admiral uh, Kurita here he gets a lot of stick for deciding to withdraw during this battle. And indeed, uh, a month after the battle, he was relieved and... Um, became a, a scribe and a, a masseur and quietly tended his garden. He did this because his spot of spotters were wildly misidentifying the ships that he was facing. And you can really only go and make judgments on the information that you have to hand and the information you have to hand is rubbish, then the likelihood is you're going to make a rubbish decision too. It also suffered several very nasty losses, both in the previous day when the poor old uh, Ushai here uh, bought it, and in the course of this battle itself, because he le uh, lost several uh, cruisers. Saw so Spitfire comments, seeing this battle, it gives me a better understanding into the mindset of Admiral Kurita being satisfied with the level of damage caused and choosing not to risk further losses, particularly because he kind of knew that the war was lost at this point and he was a Japanese admiral who didn't go down the whole kamikaze vibe. So yeah, Mushashi, 17 bombs and 19 torpedo hits. Even a super battleship 
is you know doomed by that level of that level of loss uh, his own command ship was severely damaged and had to be sent back to Borneo and he had to transship uh Yamoto took three bombs and was slowed down to something like 26 knots. It, you know, he arrived off Samar in a pretty knocked about and bad way. And then in this confusing battle, we all know now that he was only up against Taffy 3 and Taffy 2, a bunch of escort carriers and a set of uh, very heroic destroyers. But he still managed to lose a couple of cruisers, all of this. And yeah. He thought he'd done enough, and he left. And yeah, I definitely can uh, can sympathise with that experience. And so, what happens to Kurita's reputation then? Because I mean, he was a good admiral. He served almost the entire length of the Pacific War, and was involved in a number of major actions. So, thinking about reputation got me. Uh, reminding myself that I had toyed with the idea of designing a game around reputation, because reputation seems such a um, thin, misty kind of thing that then becomes fixed and legendary. So what impacts your reputation? So I, I would argue, first of all, there are a large number of political things, indeed primarily political. I'm going to illustrate that with a number of examples. So first of all, do politically you need a victory? Commodore Harwood, uh, in charge of the cruiser force that took on the Graf Spey, the Battle of River Plate, was lionised as a genius admiral. When Exeter, Achilles and Ajax got back to Britain, the crews were marched through the city of London in a victory parade, and Churchill, who was first Lord of the Admiralty at the time, obviously tried to maximise the political benefit for himself, as he would. Um, but actually, the River Plate was indecisive. It was a draw. I mean, if, if anything, his force of cruisers was, you know, slightly bested by the Graf Spey. And Langsdorff, the captain of the Graf Spey, didn't really need to put into Montevideo for repairs because it wasn't really that heavily damaged. The British naval attaché got in a boat uh, in Montevideo Harbour and went round the Grass Bay and scratched his head a lot when, well, why is it here? And of course, it was there really because Langsdorff's spirit was broken. He felt he was too far away from Germany and his crew were inevitably going to die and he wanted to save them and the merchant crew captors that he had on board from unnecessary loss. But let's sweep that under the carpet, make Harwood into a naval genius. He went on to replace Cunningham as admiral in charge of the Mediterranean fleet. Did not do well. <laughs> do well at all. Next up, you might be too politically big to sack. So... Uh, I'm going to use the example of John Jellicoe for transparency's sake. I'm a Jellicoe fan, but I realise that at Jutland, he did not live up to the expectations that people had of him. Now, the expectations people had of him were astronomical. He was expected to deliver Trafalgar version 2. And indeed, when he was first appointed... Some of his immediate subordinates said, I met Jellicoe and he is the new Nelson. Way to set up somebody to fail. Now, obviously, you know, the weather at Jutland was miserable and the intelligence reporting was even worse. And he did as well as he could do under the circumstances, I would suggest. However, despite the disappointment, they didn't remove him, and half a year or more later, they promoted him up to being first sea lord. Equally, someone who performed very badly at Jutland, say David Beatty, who, whose intelligence contribution from the battlecruiser force that was meant to be doing scouting, he was just too popular with his jaunty cap and his unusual buttons and his millionaire uh, wife who um, sucked around a lot. That's a different story. 
So, yeah, you just couldn't sack Beatty. He was already too much of a national icon in the, uh, in the papers. Equally, you might just want to hush it all up. So Albert Markham was the second in command of the Mediterranean fleet in the 1890s when Admiral Tryon, who was an expert signaller and desperate to reform British Navy signalling practice, had some sort of weird brain fart and issued an impossible turn command that would have inevitably have led to a collision. And Markham hesitated, and Tryon publicly embarrassed him with a flag signal, flag signal going, what are you waiting for? And so Markham performed the manoeuvre, and his ship, the Camperdown, rammed into HMS Victoria, uh, Tryon's flagship, and sank it with the death of Tryon and hundreds and hundreds of its crew. And of course, you know, this is HMS Victoria when a Victoria was queen. It couldn't have been more embarrassing. And of course, they had a board of inquiry and he was exonerated. And he was exonerated because the Navy professionals really didn't want to tell someone off for following orders, following very explicit and prompted orders. So they kept him on for the remainder of his tour. And then he never served on active fleet command ever again. Next up, uh, from the last episode, uh, Igneo Campinoni got rid of after Scarpavento. Now, really, this was, for me, a chain of Italian bad naval fortune. It's not his fault that Taranto had poor air defences that didn't stop the fleet air ar arm from heroically attacking the harbour, sinking ships all over the place, and that most of them were able to come back into service through the medium of the harbour not being that deep. So it wasn't too hard to raise them up and send them to repair, and four to six months later they were back in operation. And then it's not his fault that he was given uh, handcuffs in his orders, being told not to engage unless he had a very clear superiority because he was in command of what was left of the fleet operationally after Taranto. But two embarrassments in a row, only a couple of weeks apart, and it's the end of uh, Campanoni. Likewise, your reputation actually becomes almost cast in stone if you have an unambiguous victory. So, of course, Cunningham, hailed as the best admiral, whatever best means, in World War II, certainly in the Royal Navy, uh, his performance around Taranto and at um, and the Battle of Cape Matapan, of course, and indeed his conduct in the continual supply of Malta and in taking off the British army, or most of the British army from Crete, despite the high losses, um, you know, that helps. If you have a, you know, run of successes like that, then you do become a bit untouchable. And then, you know, the judgment of your peers. So we discussed Somerville in the last episode at Scarpavento. His peers thought him a very, very fine admiral as well. But you can see that only two out of these reputational factors have anything really to do with naval stuff. And that really your reputation is primarily politically motivated or politically uh, controlled. So that's, that's what I had to say, really. So thank you so much for contributing so richly. You know, nearly a thousand people watched the video. Uh, a couple of hundred of you vote or more voted. Um, nearly a hundred of you commented and, you know, big, involved, complex, deep thoughts, you know, not, not just, you know, I thought, you know, you should be exonerated and maybe given a medal. Um, you know, it's absolutely everything that this gaming community means to me and makes it all so much fun. Next episode, I will be reorganizing the fleet and to reflect on the lessons learned and then plowing in to the next battle. So for now, 
Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.